Um, great. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking about measuring collective impact and the synergies of evaluation and assessment. Um, overall today, we're going to kind of baseline for everyone, describe community assessment, evaluation, and collective impact evaluation and then demonstrate how community assessment and collective impact evaluation can work together to strengthen multi-sector initiatives that are seeking to create social change. Um, we're also going to describe SUI's approach to community assessment and collective impact um, by focusing on two case studies and examples with some of our close partners um, of some work we've done in, in recent years. Um, to get us started, I'm Pam Rush. I'm the Director of Health Equity and Assessment Research at SUHI. Um, each of my wonderful colleagues who are joining me will introduce themselves in more depth. Um, but today we have with us Jackie Jacobs, um, the Director of Evaluation at SUHI, uh, Eve Shapiro at Westside United, and Rachel Reichlin at the Michael Reese Health Trust, who will each be contributing to this presentation throughout and will introduce themselves as we go. In order to get us started, I'm gonna first talk and ground us in understanding what community health needs assessments are or community health assessments. So overall, this is a systematic process to understand the strengths, assets, needs, and challenges of a community as they relate to health and well-being. So at SUHI, we really try to focus on those strengths and assets while acknowledging the needs and challenges to move forward we often and, and regularly take a historic lens to not only health outcomes themselves, but also the upstream factors that contribute to health outcomes and inequities in those health outcomes. And we use both quantitative, so new, numeric data, um, as well as qualitative data so that we can more deeply understand the hyperlocal context of health and how it happens. The CHNA process is cyclical in nature. Um, so the first six steps of this process are really about the assessment itself, understanding alongside community partners, needs and assets and priority areas for impact. Um, but oftentimes we kind of stop at step six um, and don't really move beyond the assessment. Um, and however, there are a couple more steps. So the idea is, is you take that assessment you act upon the findings, and you also evaluate what you've done to see if you're having the impact that you intended to have. Over time, and, and really as, as CHNAs have been become mainstay to hospitals, it's become very apparent that in order to drive the needle forward um, on social needs and the root causes of health inequities, there is a need for collective impact um, that goes beyond one hospital, one institution, and across sectors to move the needle on social um, and systematic determinants of health. We have seen um, in Chicago, very particularly, an increased focus on collaborative assessments and the shift to collaborative response. And this shift really does require that we begin thinking a little differently about evaluations as well. Thanks, Pam. So um, as Pam mentioned, my name is Jackie Jacobs, and I am the Director of Evaluation at the Sinai Urban Health Institute. And um, for the assessment piece that Pam is speaking about, I am also just going to be talking a little bit about evaluation and how that, that fits in today. So now, what is evaluation? Broadly, evaluation is a systematic process to judge merit, worth, or significance using a range of evidence and values. There are a few different types of evaluation with which each answer different types of questions and use slightly different types of data. Process evaluations answer questions to assess the processes involved in your program or how it's been implemented. They also help you measure the outputs, the number of people served, the number of trainings conducted, the number of mental health screenings provided. Outcome evaluations will answer questions about whether or not your program is meeting the predefined goals and objectives defined. They're typically measuring outcomes that speak to the change you are trying to achieve. Percent increase in patients with managed diabetes, decrease in COVID-19 positivity. There are also economic evaluations that provide information on the relationship between cost and outcomes of programs, such as cost utility, 
cost benefit and cost effectiveness evaluations. And finally, impact evaluations, which we'll, we'll talk about in more detail today. And they really go beyond the predefined outcomes. So you've already defined your objectives, but there are a lot of things that are gonna happen that you may not expect. That's what impact evaluations allow you to explore. Um, what's different? What, what's a surprise? Collective impact. So the concept of collective impact stems from an article from the Stanford Social Innovation Review from 2011, which starts off by discussing a case study about improving education in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. For years, foundations and individual organizations were becoming frustrated because they noticed a lack of progress in improving student achievement. To shake things up a little, a nonprofit organization, Strive, pulled together a core group of community leaders. These leaders threw their individual agendas to the wind and decided to commit to a collective approach. Despite the 2008 recession and budget cuts, 34 of the 53 success indicators that Strive tracked showed positive trends. Large social and health problems like educational attainment, life expectancy, and overall inequities in communities cannot be solved alone or in isolation. Isolated impact describes the typical model of grant making and program implementation. Often funders will choose a few grantees from a pool of applicants, hoping to select those they feel will make the greatest contribution. They're often in competition with each other and operate in silos. This is a common approach, but there's really limited evidence that this is actually the best way to solve a complex problem. Most of the problems that you're going to hear about today in our two case studies arise from the interplay of public and private activities. As a result, complex problems can be solved only by cross-sector coalitions that engage those outside the nonprofit sector. Collective impact, on the other hand, brings together a group of partners that are all driven by the same values and commit to working together to solve a complex problem. This work is grounded in equity and inclusion and success relies on alignment and co-learning. This requires a new and sometimes uncomfortable way of thinking about how to evaluate and understand impact. But this is the only way to make meaningful and long lasting change. We need to move beyond silos and work together. There are five core aspects that together will facilitate strong partnerships, shared learning, and meaningful results. First is a common agenda. Collective impact work requires that all partners have a shared vision and mission for what they're changing and why. They need to all understand the problem and have a collective approach for how to solve it. Often partners are all working toward the same goal, but they understand the root cause of that problem a little bit differently. Collective impact work requires that everyone acknowledge their biases and without ignoring their individual work, agree to, upon a couple of key goals to work towards. Next is shared measure, a shared measurement system. It's critical to identify some key measurements at both the community and programmatic level to ensure ongoing alignment. It allows partners to hold each other accountable and learn from each other's successes and challenges. Shared measurement strategies can also improve quality and credibility of the data. Next is mutually reinforcing activities, which refers to the fact that organizations are not all doing the exact same thing. Instead, they're taking on a specific activity that aligns with their expertise and role in the community, and they use that to work towards the agreed upon goal. The success of collective impact is not about serving the largest number of people in the exact same way, but instead it's about coordinating differentiated activities. Next is continuous communication. Oh, I'm sorry, the backbone function. Everything described so far, and what you're going to hear later today in this presentation, take a lot of time and effort, and it requires staff that are solely dedicated to project management, coordination, communication, really keeping everything moving. Being adaptive and nimble is really critical in this role, and things are just constantly changing, and they need to be open to the pivots. Last is the continuous communication. Developing trust is a big hurdle, but one that's very important to the collective work. It often takes a lot of meetings with a lot of different staff. You may be orienting and reorienting folks to the initiative. Other options include web-based tools, Dropbox, Box, uh, Slack that are used to facilitate ongoing communication. Great, thank you, Jackie. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, SUI's response to this need for comprehensive understanding across assessment, collaborative impact, and program evaluation, and our work with partners to really develop this 
systematic framework and approach. As part of this approach, um, we pursue these cross-cutting principles and I will cover them and them briefly here. So first we leverage and strengthen community power through various mechanisms, including authentic engagement, capacity building, and unrelenting transparency of our work, our findings, and our impact. We use data, both the numbers and qualitative data, like interviews, focus groups, and so forth, to drive decisions and action. And to be clear, um, data is most useful if its selection and collection is driven by community members themselves. Third, all that we do is in service of achieving health equity. This is not only in the programming and the work itself, but in the assessment and evaluation of that programming. We want to make sure that we maintain equity as our focus. Fourth, we focus on building lasting capacity. And again, this capacity is not only within the staff and the partnering organizations, but also thinking about building capacity more broadly across communities. Fifth, we fervently believe that to move forward in equity, we need to break down the silos across sectors and frankly, those silos within sectors and across organizations in order to truly move forward. Six, we take a place-based approach that emphasizes the unique histories and strengths of communities and their unique contexts. And lastly, we aim to create a space of learning and growth where both successes and failures are seen as opportunities for learning and accelerating our work forward. Now that I've outlined these cross-cutting principles, I'm going to briefly discuss how we can conceptualize these different layers of assessment and evaluation and the feedback loops between these layers. So overall, the layer of assessment entails an ongoing understanding of needs and assets as defined by community themselves, and that is also very localized and grounded in place. When we're thinking about collective impact, which can entail, frankly, years of long-term work to move the needle on equity, assessment is not a one-time thing. It's not, we did it in 2010 and we're not ever gonna do it again. It's an ongoing way to understand and keep a pulse on um, shifting communities needs and shifting community assets um, and shifting community priorities to ensure that the collective work is really focused on the same priorities that the community holds. Then the collective impact evaluation layer is informed by both the assessment as well as the programmatic evaluation, which I will cover briefly in a moment. These collective aims should relate closely to the findings of the assessment, um, but they should also be broad and shared indicators that can be impacted across different types of programming that are implemented within a particular context. In addition, this level goes beyond looking at these outcomes, but seeks a deeper assessment and understanding of the functionality of the collaborative itself. So how are we working together? How well is that working? How well are we aligning to community? It's really assessing that collaborative and ensuring that um, it is working to the best of its ability, um, even you know, over and above the programs themselves. This is also a level that is ripe for sharing of learnings across programs and initiatives to ensure that we can more efficiently and briskly move towards health improvement and health equity. Our final layer within this framework is program level evaluation. And this feeds heavily into the collective impact evaluation. And it entails the assessment of program level processes, outcomes, and impacts. And it, it's not only what we oftentimes think of as traditional evaluation, but it's also about using data and evaluation findings to rapidly pivot and more quickly move towards meaningful improvement. This layer relies heavily on building capacity and agency within program teams to collect data, respond to it, and troubleshoot solutions. It also is very important to telling us what is and what is not working and to telling us why something might be working so that learnings can be shared more broadly. 
The feedback loops across this model when conceived of in this way, allow for a deeper understanding of the relationship of programs to collective impact to overall health. And it not only creates a process of rapid learning, but mobilizes partners to see their clear impact and of their work on equity. It importantly celebrates learning over the fear of failure and facilitates a more rapid transformation of systems towards equity. So with that brief overview, I'm going to transition to um, Eve Shapiro, um, my partner at Westside United, um, who to talk a little bit about some of our partnership and work in understanding and assessing Westside United's impact on the life expectancy gap on the West Side. Thanks, Pam. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm Eve Shapiro. I'm the Director of Data and Evaluation at Westside United. Um, so today I'll tell you a little bit about Westside United, how our assessment framework was developed, and then our current collective impact work. So as many of us know, there are very deep health inequities across Chicago's neighborhoods, um, and Chicago's West Side is a very clear example of this. So here we have a map of Chicago's West Side, and the numbers represent life expectancy for each neighborhood. So if you follow the three L lines, the green, the blue, and the pink, you can see as life expectancy decreases as you travel away from the loop. So for some neighborhoods, this disparity is up to 14 years. In response to this huge inequity um, in the life expectancy gap, six hospital institutions, along with community partners, came together a few years ago to build a community-focused collaborative approach to address this gap. So Westside United, which officially started in 2018, is a focused local response to these health inequities. And our collaborative is composed of our six hospital anchor institutions, which you can see there. Um, and that includes Sinai Chicago, along with many other partners like other healthcare providers, such as FQHCs, education providers, uh, the faith community, businesses, government, and individual residents. So these groups and individuals work together to coordinate investments, and share outcomes in order to achieve our mission of building community health and economic wellness on Chicago's West Side. Now, at its core, West Side United is a health equity and place-based approach to supporting and growing neighborhood vitality. Our vision is to improve neighborhood health by addressing inequities across four impact areas. You can see those here in the puzzle piece. So we look at health and healthcare, neighborhood and the physical environment, education and economic vitality. And although our collective has these six anchor hospitals as our foundation, we know that we must go outside of the hospital walls if we truly want to address structural inequities and improve health across communities and neighborhoods. So because of this, our member hospitals and our partners uh, pursue innovative solutions to improve outcomes across these four impact areas with the overarching aim of reducing the life expectancy gap between the loop and the west side by 50% by 2030. So although we had this goal of reducing the life expectancy gap by 50%, um, we knew that this was a bold and broad goal and it wasn't explicitly connected to the individual programs that were on the ground across those four impact areas. So what Westside United needed was an assessment framework and a data infrastructure that could accomplish uh, these goals listed here. So we wanted to tie our program specific goals and outcomes to our overarching goal of addressing the life expectancy gap. We wanted to be able to guide our strategies and our programs, bring together community stakeholders around a set of shared goals and definitely remain, remain rooted in health equity um, and also consider the unique needs of individual West Side neighborhoods. So faced with this challenge, uh, leaders at Westside United sought out the expertise of SUGI in part because of their place-based equity-minded work. Um, and we knew that they had a rigorous uh, and data-driven methodology, but were also really community-oriented, which is a priority for us. So Westside United convened a group of experts on population health from our partner institutions, as well as from the Chicago Department of Public Health and Civic Consulting Alliance. Um, so the group was initially led by SUHI's president at the time, Sharon Homan, who then handed the role over to Pam Rush, who's SUHI's Director of Health Equity and Assessment Research. 
So the group met twice monthly for about six months to determine how to address the challenge. And by the end of the period had developed a framework, um, and you can see an overarching framework here, uh, that met the aforementioned goals. So Westside United's metric work group developed a measurement framework that crosses several levels of intended impact and aims to foster ongoing learning and improvement across our programs so that we can continuously grow. So this slide conceptually outlines this three-tiered measurement model. We have our overarching goal at the top, our impact areas, and then our programs at the bottom. And each layer of this model includes a series of metrics that we use to organize our understanding about how our programs affect the impact areas and ultimately affect health and life expectancy. So I'm gonna walk through the first two tiers in detail and then I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on with our programs. So in tier one, uh, we start with our overarching goal to reduce the life expectancy gap. So ultimately to reduce the gap, we must see meaningful improvements in health. And so at this level, we wanna measure health outcomes that tie directly to the gap in life expectancy. So to develop a comprehensive understanding what was really driving that life expectancy gap that we see on the West side, um, the metrics work group worked with the Department of Public Health to conduct a decomposition analysis. And that took each of our West Side neighborhoods and compared the causes and ages of death to causes and ages of death in the near North neighborhood. So this decomposition analysis was able to tease apart all those individual causes that were building up to the life expectancy gap. So for example, Austin at the time had a life expectancy about 11 and a half years below um, the near north community area. So this analysis was able to look at those 11 and a half years and find that two and a half of those years came from a disproportionate number of heart disease related deaths in Austin. Um, so in addition to the decomposition analysis, we also pulled information from community listening sessions that were held in 2017 and 2018. So these listening sessions uh, invited Westside residents to describe the health challenges that they saw in their neighborhoods. And so we used the results of the analysis along with the feedback from the sessions to identify five key drivers of the life expectancy gap. And you can see those five drivers in bold. Um, but they are cardiometabolic diseases, um, including heart disease and diabetes, cancers, infant mortality, homicide, and opioid overdose. And beneath them are the metrics that we use to track changes in those drivers over time. Um, so those are related deaths and hospitalizations. And I wanna note that infant mortality, homicide and opioid overdose particularly impact the life expectancy gap through the early deaths that these drivers are responsible for. So for infants, youth and people in their twenties and thirties, and that really pulls down the overarching life expectancy in our West Side communities. So next we move into the second tier, which is the four West Side United impact areas. Um, and I pulled these out earlier in their education, economic vitality, neighborhood and physical environment and health and healthcare. And so this tier represents a more structural level of change. And our premise is that if we can affect change and improvements across these four impact areas, we would in turn expect to see movement and improvement in the health and life expectancy metrics that I just covered. So it's important to note that within um, the first and second tiers, measurements are at the community-wide or population level. So for example, we're measuring unemployment across all West Side United community areas um, rather than among participants within a particular program, which will be in the next tier. So in order to identify the metrics for uh, these tier two impact areas, the group took a long list, I think it was over 200 metrics uh, that were collected over time at the community area level and assessed which of those factors might contribute most to the inequities seen in life expectancy and those five key drivers of the life expectancy. So that assessment led us to our final model, which you can see here. And at the top, we have the five drivers and key contributors to the drivers. Then in tier two, we have between six and 15 metrics for each impact area. And each metric is tied to a particular driver, which you can see indicated in the superscript. It might be a little small. Um, so for example, if you look in the blue neighborhood and physical environment domain, um, under the first measure for food insecurity, 
that we believe that changes at the community level in food insecurity um, would impact community level outcomes for cardiometabolic disease, cancer, and infant mortality, while probably having a lesser impact on homicide and opioid overdose. Um, so you can see that those are indicated by the superscript next to the metric. Uh, there are some impact areas like education and economic vitality, and those have metrics that impact overall well-being and would likely to impact all of the drivers of the life expectancy gap. Um, since we know that there's a really tight connection between economic well-being, educational attainment, and health. So while these metrics are quantitative, their selection was driven both by qualitative and quantitative assessment of health and well-being in West Side communities. And in particular, as I mentioned before, the group leveraged the insights from community listening sessions in 2017 and 2018 to make this selection. So finally, we get to our programs. And this is the third tier, uh, which is measurement at the collective impact and program level. So we track progress, uh, process and outcome metrics for our programs to both monitor progress and also enable us to continuously reflect and improve our programming and ideally our outcomes. So for example, we collect information on our small business grantees and we do that to see how our grants support growth in their business income and ability to hire new staff, well-being and other outcomes. Um, so some of those outcomes align with outcomes from other programs. Um, so for example, we've seen how this program can impact local hiring um, and also our local hiring initiative impacts that and our career pathways program and our impact investing program. So we can look across all those programs to estimate what our impact on hiring has been. Um, so local hiring is one of our community level metrics that's in that green economic vitality domain um, in tier two and then ties back to the drivers of the life expectancy gap, sort of creating that through line between the tiers. So additionally, we can also look at the small business hiring data to get a sense of whether the program has been working in the way that we want it to, and if we want to make any adjustments. So the three-tiered framework helps us connect the dots both between our programs and our overarching goals, and doing that mapping really helps foster a culture of continuous learning and improvement as we move towards our goal of reducing the life expectancy gap and health inequities. We also use the framework bi-directionally, so not just from the bottom up, but also from the top down, uh, to monitor what's happening at a community-wide level. And then we can take that information and respond proactively with our programs and initiatives. So for example, when COVID emerged last year, we saw in almost real time uh, the devastating impact on our West Side communities because of both the relationship between COVID outcomes and our drivers, as well as the impacts in our tier two metrics from the socioeconomic effects from the pandemic. So we thought about how COVID outcomes interplay with our framework in the short term, even though it was not one of the top five mortality drivers at the time of the assessment. So having this awareness and flexibility and a framework to work off of has really helped Westside United respond to both COVID disease specific needs, uh, for example, around um, hypertension, and also to the economic and food security challenges that were caused by the pandemic. So finally, I'm gonna dive into our program level information in tier three. So there are a few activities that we're doing to understand collective impact of our programs. And the first is that we've established key metrics to monitor collective progress. Um, so one of the collective impact metrics I mentioned is unemployment. Um, we gather data across programs like our local hiring, local procurement, small business grant, and impact investing um, to better understand how they all contribute to our goal of creating new West Side hires. Um, additionally, we develop internal West Side United data infrastructure and capacity for data collection among our staff. Um, we try and ground decisions in our strategic plan, um, which is the document that helps us share the roadmap across the collaborative with all of our different stakeholders. Um, we communicate progress transparently with stakeholders and the community at large. And under the guidance of PAM, who leads our metrics work group, we've established learning goals to understand our alignment and connectivity as a collaborative. And of course, we also conduct a lot of program level evaluation. 
And this involves developing logic models for all of our programs. Um, these logic models really help us clarify the links between the program outcomes, the collective impact metrics, and our overarching community needs. Um, and then we share this understanding of program activities across Westside United and beyond, like here, for instance. Uh, we also work to build capacity across Westside United staff, our grantees and partners. And we do this by holding staff training sessions throughout the year. Um, we've also tried pairing staff members with evaluation and data experts. Uh, we engage our community advisory council members. We actually have a couple members who sit on our metrics work group and help us think through how we are evaluating our progress. And we provide technical assistance around data and evaluation to grantees of some of our programs. And finally, we really aim to foster a culture of learning and rapid response. So we assess our progress often and really reiterate the importance of pivoting for effectiveness and efficiency. So we move towards our goal of improving health and well-being on the west side. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Reichlin with the Health First Collaborative. Thank you, Eve, for sharing the inspiring work of Westside United, one of our partners as well, and to our partners at SUHI for inviting us to highlight our unique collaboration that's a little bit younger than the Westside United project. My name is Rachel Reichlin. I'm a public health nurse and senior program officer at Michael Reese Health Trust in Chicago, the incubator of the Health First Collaborative. Next slide, please. Before we dive into describing the Health First Collaborative, I want to touch briefly on some unique aspects of Michael Reese as an organization that enabled us to catalyze this collective effort. As a public foundation focusing explicitly on health, we have built key relationships throughout two decades of grant making as we strive to ensure all Chicagoans can live healthy lives. We do this in three ways, through incubation, through grant making and through advocacy. Incubation and advocacy are relatively new for us since transitioning to a public foundation a few years ago. Next slide, please. With an energetic CEO and the support of our board, our incubation function allows us to respond quickly, strategically and collectively to share the risk of seeding adaptive solutions. There are three components that help us be especially nimble. One are the deep relationships and expertise across our partners, both with regards to our funder colleagues and our grantees. Two, an expedited review process that can help us move money quickly. And three, flexibility in our staffing to shift capacity to a new effort. We can also draw on our advocacy program to amplify some of the key learnings from our incubation efforts another asset of being a public foundation. Next slide, please. In early 2020, in response to the twin pandemics of systemic racism and COVID-19, a group of funders formed the Health First Collaborative with the intention to support community-led demonstration pilots that can be replicated and or scaled to address the root causes of racial health inequities and ultimately improve the physical, mental, and social well-being of all individuals and families in the Chicagoland region. We believe in the resilience of communities and individuals most impacted by the complex challenges we are facing as a society. In standing up the Health First Collaborative, we were committed to create an infrastructure to support community assets and build on those assets, their strengths, their trusted relationships and their leadership. Well, we didn't know exactly what the work would look like, we knew enough to bring in a lead evaluator right from the beginning. We knew that early evaluation support offers critical guidance for this iterative, responsive, and forward-thinking effort. We were fortunate that Suhi wanted to roll up their sleeves and partner with us in building the Health First Collaborative. Suhi brings a unique constellation of expertise and a track, work, a track record of authentic community engagement that we saw as foundational for this work. Their culturally responsive evaluation approach, ability to create structure with stakeholders from different sectors, and flexibility made them the right partner for this effort. What SUHI can help us better understand and document now will serve as evidence to strengthen systems and improve health equity. 
In this slide, you see in the green boxes some of the key stakeholders who are designing the infrastructure for the effort. While this work started with private funders, it is also driven by community members and public partners. We knew that we needed a way to work closely with the community to define the North Star for this work and lead us to what health really looks like. Suhi helped us build out a community advisory council in both English and Spanish to guide this work. We also knew that public partners, including the city, county, and state health departments, would really be critical as we chart new ways to access and support public health. Philanthropy can go quickly and public partners and government can go deep. So we needed those different sectors at the table. The blue boxes on this slide represent the demonstration pilots of the Health First Collaborative. We are currently supporting two community-led hubs of health transformation, one centering community health centers and the other focusing on hyper-local community organizations as they mobilize their community to access information about the COVID-19 vaccine and navigate to critical health resources. Hub two is called the Vaccine Core Partnership. The pilots of both hubs receive wraparound support, including Suhi as the evaluation partner, as well as policy and advocacy expertise to take their learnings to scale and push for just systems change. The Health First Collaborative launched in July of 2020 with five funders at the table and has expanded to 16 participating foundations who have collectively contributed over $4.8 million to date. The majority of those dollars are currently prioritized to stand up a multi-year effort for Hub One. This work is being recognized and lifted up by the state as they leverage dollars for health transformation and by city and national partners as community engaged models provide an on-ramp for a critical public health workforce. The crises that we are facing at present are, present an opportunity to build better, smarter and more just systems. As a public health nurse, I believe that everything is public health. The places we live, work, play, and learn, everybody has a role. People now know what public health is and are now starting to see themselves having that role. And that is an opportunity. As Pam and Jackie explained at the beginning of the session, this is a long game and we are at an inflection point that could be a game changer. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Jackie Jacobs to speak in more depth about the different components and activities of the Health First Collaborative. Thank you, Rachel, for that intro and for being a, a true leader and thought partner in this work and, and for agreeing to work with us. It's, it's really exciting. So uh, I'm Jackie Jacobs, the Director of Evaluation at SUHI. And as Rachel mentioned, really key, the way I'm gonna kick this off with, with what is so key to this effort, which is centering the community voice in this work. Because of this, we determined that it was really critical to engage the community from the beginning, pulling, pulling from SUHI's network, um, those of the funder, as well as the pilot sites and recruiting for two community advisory committees. One is held in English and the other in Spanish. We thought that it was important to offer a Spanish speaking space for those who felt more comfortable rather than ask them to speak English or bring in an interpreter. This allows for more authentic discussions that will not lose meaning when translated into English. While they are operating separately, each meeting has the same agenda and the two groups will be coming together this month for a visioning session. Each CAC named themselves Equidad and Ciudado de Salud and Voices for Health Equity. They each have 12 members and they represent um, all parts of Chicagoland and come to each meeting with a wealth of lived experience. Each of the pilot sites are also asked to join a bi-monthly learning collaborative session. Anyone from the organizations are invited to join and we identify a topic of interest to sites, develop an agenda, and some discussion questions ahead of time to help them think through who might be best to join the call. We've met four times since October and encourage open and candid discussion. We want this to be a space for organizations to share updates, challenges, and seek input from their colleagues at other sites. As Rachel mentioned, this is an innovative opportunity. Um, they're, they're encouraged to test new things and learn from each other. Things are not going to go perfectly and we need people to feel comfortable sharing those experiences so we can move forward. 
The first session was very introductory and provided a space for relationship building and goal setting. The second meeting was in, in December. Um, we held this second session and focused on identifying those shared outcomes and measurements across pilot sites. In February, for our third meeting, one pilot site shared their approach for communication and marketing to the rest of the stakeholders, um, especially as it related to telemedicine, and used this to launch into a discussion of how to share their work, share findings, and seek feedback from stakeholders. And finally, this month, we focused on partnership and collaboration, particularly as it relates to the changing roles of organizations in the wake of a pandemic. In conjunction with community experience, we also use data to drive decision-making. These maps should look very familiar to you all from our partners at the Chicago Department of Public Health. And you can really see how COVID across Chicago, just like in many other places in the nation, has been disproportionately impacting communities of color. And because Chicago is so segregated, those instances of higher percent positivity were focused on the West and South sides. This map from June 2020 shows just that, which helped the Health First Collaborative funders focus in on pilot sites that are serving these populations. And the next slide shows a very similar pattern. So you can see high hardship index scores and how they vary across Chicago with most concentration of high hardship index scores on the west and south sides. And finally, um, let's take a look at this last map quickly, which um, shows as of early 2021 where mental health providers are in Chicago. To orient you, the blue represents a higher number of providers and the green represents smaller number of providers. I'm sure you're all thinking the same thing that we were thinking when we saw this, which is especially with COVID and the impact on our communities, the need for mental health providers is stronger than ever and they just aren't there. This is the type of data that we want to see change as a result of the first hub. While the, the entire focus of this initiative is not on mental health, remember that a key component of collective impact work is on coordination. And mental health is a part of that coordinated effort. And it's also driven from our community health advisory committee who identified this as one of the top issues impacting their community. We've used key epi trends similar to Westside United um, related to COVID and mental health and all of the input from our stakeholders, which include funders, the programs and community residents to help us decide on a metrics framework that will be used to tracking progress. This framework is, in, is divided into the following five categories, health outcomes, healthcare quality experience, partnership and collaboration, investment and community connectivity. This will be a mixture of both community and program level metrics that will help tell the story of impact across the collaborative. This is all still in the works, but we're honing in on metrics related to COVID-19, mental health, patient satisfaction and access, language accessibility, dollars and human capital, and connection and synergy between communities and the private sector. I'm now gonna take you back to this collective impact diagram, which is an important framework for bringing us back to how we're doing this work successfully. Early on, Rachel described the mission and values of this initiative um, and how, how things are iterative and things have changed. There's been input from stakeholders which have led to the development of a cross sector theory of change. We've also worked with our, our key stakeholders and our um, including the community advisory committee, including funders and pilot sites to identify key indicators at both the programmatic and community level, which are being tracked quarterly to demonstrate progress. As mentioned, these pilot sites are doing slightly different work. So the key indicators are not comprehensive of all of the work that's being done at each site. The pilot programs are different, but reinforce the work of each other. The learning collaboratives allow opportunities for open discussion and a place to learn from each other. There's accountability and we revisit how they're going to work together to drive that long-term goal of improving equity for those in Chicagoland. Suhi has been serving as the backbone for this first hub as we operate as both the convener and the evaluator. It's so critical to have staff dedicated to organizing and providing folks with what they need to do their work most successfully. We wanna take that burden off of the pilot site so they can focus on the direct service to clients. And finally, continuous communication. As I stated before, the learning opportunities provide that space for communication as do monthly meetings that we have with each site. And at the program level, 
our first step was to describe each pilot program. And we did this by working closely with each organization to develop a logic model. This helped sites to articulate their activities and their expected outcomes and goals. We worked with them to identify program specific indicators. Some of these feed into that cross site theory of change, but others are more specific to that site's particular program. And finally, we provide ongoing technical assistance and capacity building to document successes and encourage innovation. As the intent of this is an impact evaluation at this time, um, some of that means documenting the progress that we're making on outcomes that we've divide, defined, as well as those that we didn't expect. Um, some of these are, are eliciting outcomes and surprises, um, and we're changing and pivoting as, as things arise. So it's been an incredible opportunity. We're, we're so grateful to um, Michael Reese Health Trust and all of the other funders of the Health First Fund for, for supporting this important work. Thank you so much. I think um, we're going to turn this over to Cindy who will help facilitate a couple of questions. Thank you to all the presenters. That was fantastic. Um, thank you for sharing all of that great information. So we do have a number of questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, a question directed to Westside United. Um, this is a very broad question, but um, how have you all maintained fidelity to a collective impact approach? Um, I imagine organization sector uh, specific aims and goals could easily still come up. Um, that's a good question. I, I think at its root, like we have to do collective impact to reach our goal. It's so huge. There's, there's no way of getting around that. And we're constantly like building. So you saw our framework, you know, we have 50 metrics and at Westside United's programs individually just get towards a few of those. So we're constantly, you know, like developing partnerships with other organizations and entities that are addressing some of those other metrics that we aren't able to get to through our own. Um, so I'd say that's, that's our approach. Thank you, Eve. Um, the next question that we have here is for the first health, the health first collaborative, what did you pull from, uh, for the, eva uh, from evaluation literature to build this framework? It seems like it needed to be innovative and responsive to current events. So Jackie or Rachel. Sure. So, um, yeah, this, this was something new that we were doing and we knew that we needed to respond to things very quickly as they change. So some of this, at least at the beginning, has really been using ideas from developmental evaluation, which is that you are, you are changing as things arise. Um, and that's, that's been encouraged and, and that's the way things are going in this environment. Everything is changing very, very quickly. We also really wanted to use participatory and culturally responsive methods. So we use the culturally responsive evaluation frameworks to really walk us through um, and, ma and make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable to being evaluators that are, are centering the community and centering equity. So those have been really key pieces, as well as some rapid cycle evaluation to be able to change our, our approaches quickly to do continuous quality improvement and learning and being able to share that back with our stakeholders quickly. I don't know, Rachel, if you have anything that you wanna to add to that. I think your response with regards to the evaluation literature is spot on. I would just say that there's different components of the Health First Collaborative. And whether it's the learning collaborative or an individual pilot, that um, we were able to develop some structure underneath those sort of buckets of work that help that help that was helpful. Great, thank you. Um, so here's another question that we have, and this is for for any of the presenters. What are some of the biggest challenges you have faced in doing collective impact work? I can maybe get started and I, there's, there's probably several of them, but actually um, in the chat, someone messaged me individually and I'm, so I'm gonna touch a little bit on that question too with, with this response. Um, one of the things from a, 
um, methodological perspective um, that I am finding more and more with doing place-based work is that a lot of our underlying theories or approaches to assess impact do not account for the very real um, presence of gentrification and displacement in Chicago that happens with community development. Um, and so one of the ways that marrying that, that ongoing assessment and keeping a pulse on, on the broader community ties with ensuring that the collective impact actually reaches the people it was intended to, to reach from the beginning is ensuring that we are constantly talking to commun communities about what's happening in communities, um, trying to leverage it, and working with partners, because I'm not an expert on this either, um, not only like ACS or demographic data, but also there's all these other types of data sets out there that other partners are a lot better um, at, at navigating than myself. And then understanding kind of those leading indicators of, okay, we're starting to see some of these indicators of gentrification. Like how do we curb that before um, our place-based work, you know, to ensure our place-based work is impacting the groups that we intended for it to impact. So that's, I think, an ongoing challenge of figuring out how do we navigate and how do we re refine our models to account for they, they have an underlying assumption that that community isn't, isn't changing, but we know in Chicago, um, particularly through larger economic forces, oftentimes communities are forced to change. And we wanna make sure our assessment combined with our collective impact is accounting for that. And I will say that I think um, one of the very real challenging things about this work from an evaluation perspective is identifying the key the key metrics that are shared across sites. I think it's it's fairly easy to um, identify what those outcomes and indicators are for one particular program, but to work across a couple that are doing slightly different things but all working towards the same goal is hard. And then once you identify those, then you have to figure out if they're all measuring it the same way. I think that's something that people don't always think about is COVID positivity is COVID positivity. It's not, it, you know, it is more complex than that as is um, mental health or um, even I think the one that we've talked about a lot is no show rate. How, how are different sites calculating no show rate? How is that slightly different? And how do they each tell a little bit of a different story? And let's bring everyone to agree upon the same method for measuring that so that we can look at it over time. Yes, thanks. Thank you both for sharing. Um, we have another question in the chat um, to any of the panelists. What has been the most rewarding part of your work? I'm happy to share that the most rewarding part of the work is the, the connections and the people that I get to work with and the, the change that we get to make collectively uh, I will say that I hearing different stakeholders talk in one voice about the work is very rewarding. It, it gives me uh, inspiration and motivation that this collective impact work can work and is working and we're, we're getting there. My answer was going to be something very similar. I think being able to work with people from different disciplines across Chicagoland is, is the only way this work is going to get done. And I think, um, you know, hearing about people's expertise and seeing that integrate into this work um, is, is incredibly rewarding. I really liked, um seeing how some of our activities that we we're doing in partnership with our hospital anchor institutions, um, hopefully knock on wood, will lead to long-term sustained change. I think especially like systemic internal policies that um, impact kind of economic access to Westsiders. Um, we're hoping that, you know, through our programs, we can change those and those changes will be long lasting and have long-term impacts on the West side. And I can, I, I want to repeat and acknowledge um, it, very similar responses. I also feel 
um, this sense of we've talked for a long time about like, and I and I've heard this from different like fun, funding mechanisms and in, in broader like we need to collaborate, we need to collaborate, we need to collaborate. But I feel like there has really been like Rachel said that it's it's an inflection point where I I see it happening the collaboration at across institutions across sectors community becoming partners in this real authentic way um, it's not easy but it's really exciting because it feels different um, and I and and clearly that's the only way we're going to be able to move forward um, so that's been really exciting.